super, super excited to see you all. I was really fired up when I looked at the list of people who are coming because you all come from some of the best companies I could have ever heard of, uh, only some of which I'm an investor in. So I would, uh, I, I still wish everybody great success, but you have great taste in colleagues if you're hanging around with the group that put this on. Uh, I, I want to use my time really wisely, and so I'm going to zoom through two really fun blasts from the past. And a blast from the past to me is a little bit of a story with a little bit of a character and a little bit of a lesson. And the lessons that we're going to talk about today, the two in particular, uh, come from people you might not expect. So let's dive in and I'll talk to you a little bit about these, um, these two blasts from the past. Before I do that, I want to put a frame around the past. What does it mean, the past? The past is up here on this slide. And I'd love for anybody who's brave and likes graphs of data to sort of look at the slide and then narrate for us what they see. Anybody really have a thing for things like this? Please, uh, Il Ilya, please tell me what you see and say it real loud. Well, first, zoom out. What is this? What is this? There were many dips around 1250, but what is this particular <laughs> dip? Do you want this? Oh, come on, Ilya. Don't, pr don't pretend like you don't want it. <laughs> what is it? This. So this is a measure of wealth? Yes. World GDP per capita, the total economic output of Earth divided by the population of Earth. Keep going. And so this, sh this shows that over most of history, in general, it's been pretty flat. Yes. And in fact, beautiful description, well done. Um, if you could read the source, which I don't think you can, it would say this is the analysis that was done by Brad DeLong, who's an economist at Berkeley. Now, Brad's paper that he did this part of these data are from was GDP uh, 1 million BC to the present. I lopped off the period from 1,000 to 1 million because nothing good was happening. I, and the point, the point is readily made with just 800 years or so of misery. And that's what this flat, bumpy down period is. Have you ever worked in a company that never grew? Or have heard of, maybe you have a friend who worked in a company that never grew? <laughs> Uh, or maybe a company where one-third of the people just disappeared one day. That's what that divot is, the, the plague. This is terrible, terrible. Yet it was the, the dominant feature of our lives on Earth. Well, not ours, thank God, but the people who came before us. And during this terrible period is where we perfected all those awful things about human nature, right? This is where we wrote the operating system that permitted slavery, and we wrote the operating system that, pro, pro, that celebrated keeping certain people in certain spots based on their gender. Um, th this is the inflection point that's so interesting to me, and it's what I've spent my life focused on. Even as an undergraduate, when I first saw these stories about industrial revolution, it really knocked me over. And it knocked all of us over, because have you ever seen the show The Beverly Hillbillies? You know, they accidentally strike oil in their backyard. Well, that isn't completely us, but it kind of is. For the most of the last 200 years, we've been riding an up and to the right roller coaster where we discovered how to power machines with outrageous, at outrageous scale, totally unbound the amount of work we could do from how many people we had, and the productivity skyrocketed as a result. And, and my point of view, I'll preface this and say that I am okay if I am the wacky libertarian capitalist in your life. Uh, everybody <laughs> needs at least one, and I am, I am pretty much one in San Francisco. Uh, this up and to the right curve gives us the wealth, the financial wealth as a, as a planet, to go back and fix all the terrible things we invented here. Every scrap of good thing that I see in the world, education, opportunity, justice, art, more freedom for more people, is paid for by that industrial wealth. Totally separate session we could have on how to divide that wealth, but this is just about how did the pie get to be tantalizingly large, not about how we divide it. 
keep this in mind as we go through these next two stories, because the two protagonists I want to tell you about, Harriet Tubman and Barbara Minto, are two incredibly important people in this drama. So blast from the past, number one, Harriet Tubman scaling. This is a picture, a photograph of Harriet Tubman in the later years of her life, well after the Civil War had ended. Harriet, it's hard to tell because there's no banana for scale, but she's about five feet tall. Any Imager fans? <laughs> it's a dumb Imager joke. Um, uh, uh, she's about five feet tall, and she's, in this picture, I believe she's in her 70s or 80s. So it's after the war. Did anybody study the Civil War or American history in secondary school? Yeah, tell me, what do you, do you remember anything about Harriet in particular? Yes, in case you couldn't hear, Harriet's one of the best known conductors of the Underground Railroad, which is a network of volunteers who would shepherd uh, for, uh, American slaves who decided they had had enough, shepherd them out of the South and into the North, and get them as far away from the Confederacy as possible. And, and she would literally lead bands of people through this network of roads and backwoods and homes that she could have as a safe house until she could get people first to Pennsylvania, and later, because of the changing laws around Fugitive Slave Act and stuff, she'd have to take them even further north into northern New York State, and then eventually had to go all the way to Canada to, to really get out of harm's way. She's an underground railroad conductor, very famous. There's a whole bunch of stuff about Harriet that nobody ever gets taught that I only discovered because I really fell in love with her story. This, the thing that got me hooked on Harriet was... Uh, in, in addition to her heroic work in the Underground Railroad, she would um, uh, cross the border repeatedly teaching uh, free, freed American slaves how to start their own business. And the businesses that she helped people start were the businesses that she herself started to fund her own life. That was uh, laundry business, baking business, um, chores and errands business. She was... She was an entrepreneur as well as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. The other stuff that really caught my eye that I was never taught in uh, school was um, uh, that she lived her entire adult life with a terrible head injury. Uh, when she was still enslaved in the South, she was in town running errands for her owner, a woman named Eliza Broadus. And a, a clerk in the store, somebody in the store was throwing a lead weight, of all things, at, a, at another slave who had done something. The person who threw it missed the intended target, and it hit Harriet in the head. And the sum total of her medical care was three days in a rocking chair with no medical attention while she sort of nursed herself back to functionality. And, and, and the rest of her life was spent in tremendous pain with seizures and, and all of the side effects you'd imagine from being smashed in the head with a lead weight. Some of the other stuff, though, is really mind-blowing. This is the classified ad that her boss took out, her owner took out when Harriet ran away. Harriet, whose birth name was Araminta, she went by Minty until she got her freedom and she changed her own name to Harriet. You can see it about halfway down the page. Minty, age 27, uh, blah, 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 and the reward that was offered for returning her. All, uh, all stuff you may or may not have known. Here's the stuff that you really didn't know. About 10 years after she had really seized her own freedom, she became a secret agent for the North. And because she was so comfortable moving between the North and the South, and because she never got stopped by any of the Confederates that she was spying on, she got to be a favored uh, agent, secret agent of the North. And this, this, this is the text of a pass that she carried around in her pocket. It says, pass the bearer Harriet Tubman to Buford and back to this place wherever she wants to go. Basically, free, ride free pass on any government transport. She could buy anything she wanted, supplies. And her whole mission was to gather information from the South and disseminate it to the generals and the key uh, military folks in the North who needed to know. Additionally, she built up, in the course of this, she built up like crazy a network of informants. These were both free and enslaved Americans who were in the South, and they fed her information, and in return, she shared information back to them. 
Fast forward another five years or so, pardon me, three or four years of this while the war is happening, um, Harriet comes up with an idea. Harriet and a, and a, and a colonel uh, in the Union Army said, we think that there's a network of American slaves round about the Combahee River area of South Carolina, which if you know anything about South Carolina, this was the, the, if there was a world capital of American slavery, it was here. People were treated horribly. Uh, the, the, the hardcore slave owners were, they were an 11 out of 10 on the bad scale. Uh, and Harriet had built quite a network in this area, and she said, what if we, what if we took some boats in the middle of the night and offered these folks a way out. And the colonel was fired up to try this, but he was like, I'm not gonna be able to convince any of my soldiers to go on this raid. She says, well, I'll work on that. She goes back and she makes friends with the head of the first South Carolina volunteers who was an all African American um, contingent of freed American slaves who had taken up arms against the Confederacy. And she convinced two steamboats, crews, the first South Carolina volunteers, and the colonel to let her go do this. The night of the raid, they, they set out in the middle of the night, they go up the river. Remember, she had been in this business for about 15, 20 years at this time, the business of freeing people. And in the sum total of her career, she had freed personally about 70 or 80 people on her underground railroad tracks, and she had taught a lot of other people how to free, free American slaves as well. This one night, they sailed up the river, and she had pre-wired the alert in the town, so everybody who was paying attention knew that tonight, you're going to hear three blasts of the steam whistle come down to the river. No one knew how many people would come. She sails up there with her contingent of armed men. They, they ground the, or they dock the two steamboats. They blow the whistle. 800 800 American slaves came pouring out of the plantations. In one night, she 10 x her entire life's work, and it kind of blew her away. They didn't have enough space for everybody, but they made it work. They, people had to abandon their material possessions. This engraving that's up on the screen shows the, the uh, it's, it's fictionalized because they didn't actually leave anybody behind. 800 people in a night. How did she 10x her lifetime's work? If you go back and you look at what made her a successful conductor in that prototype of the, of the uh, Underground Railroad, she was very small in her kind of efforts, right? She was taking bands of five to 10 people at a time, but what was her fuel was her values. And that gave her energy. And her values were, I wanna go back and convince my family to come with me. And she would repeatedly go back to Maryland, where she was from, and she would try to convince her brother or her sister or her husband to come with her back to the north, and she knew the way. And sometimes they would go, she was able to take her brother and her sister out, sometimes they wouldn't, her husband refused to come with her. He had remarried without telling her, that really broke her heart. But it was her values that kept her going. Second thing is her quick wins, after her second, third, and fourth trip, those were big wins, and that built trust for her all along the network. The families who hosted the fleeing, uh, the freed American slaves, the, the people who provided money and food kind of gathered more behind her, and that built a reputation for her. Third, she was able to recruit those allies, people who weren't necessarily going to take the same level of risk as her, but who would help her tremendously along the way. The person who gave her a pistol which was a capital offense for uh, an African-American woman, a freed slave, to own a firearm. She had a pistol with her in her pocket. The people who, uh, who told her, who warned her of the drunk uh, uh, soldiers who were two miles up the road, that's the kind of allies I'm talking about. And fourth, she wrote a playbook and she iterated it. She took what she knew and she taught other people how to be good conductors on the road. That allowed her to make many small batches of freedom. When she got bigger, she graduated to using other people's money and skills. At the time of the Combahee River Raid, she was walking around with $15,000 of US dollars in her pocket. To put that in perspective, that was the walking around money 
It was her walking around money from the government, and it was equivalent to the year's salary of a senior officer. She was trusted with other people's resources and skills. Second, her trust networks became this broad reputation to the point where when she showed up at the first South Carolina Volunteers and says, I have a crazy mission for you, they had heard of her. They knew who she was. They called her Moses. Third, her networks became quite literally armies, people who were unstoppable once they decided to get somewhere. And fourth, she taught the playbook. To me, this is how our technology company should be scaling. We should be starting with small wins and self-confidence to know that if we do the small things really well and repeatedly, we will earn an opportunity to do the big things. Instead, what I see a lot of times is entrepreneurs and their teams getting super fired up because the money dump truck has backed up and poured gasoline and cash onto a company that actually isn't ready for it. And so I think that this model for scaling is a much healthier way to approach the problem of how do we 10x our business. And I know, just looking at your backgrounds and hearing the stories of where you all are from, that you're in a power position in these companies to influence it so that we take these more thoughtful steps towards 10xing our growth. I would rather see Harriet like scaling in our industry to make these longer lasting changes stick. Blast from the past too, and I'm going to pick up the pace a little because I know I got the high sign that we're running out of time. This is Barbara Minto. Barbara was one of the first 20 women admitted to the Harvard Business School in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. And I just want you, if you have any idea what it would feel like or what might be going through your head as you're one of the first 20 women to enter the 900 person class of MBAs at Harvard in the late 1950s, what would be going through her mind? Just shout it out. Holy shit. <laughs> I'll buy that. What else? How will I get taken seriously? How will I succeed? How can I get this? How can I open the doors for the next wave? 20 out of 900, not a great ratio. Barbara would say yes to all of that. And she'd also say that um, she was super excited about the opportunity, but she was scared because she didn't know how she would fit in with this group. Barbara had finished high school but never gone to four-year college. Her first job right out of high school was as a secretary, a stenographer, and she had found out that Harvard was letting people in, letting women in, and so she applied and she felt great pride but also great trepidation for all the reasons you'd imagine. Well, when she showed up at this prototype product called Women at the Harvard Business School, uh, it was even worse than she had imagined. Um, the, 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 the idea was so experimental for Harvard that they they said, we really shouldn't put these women in the classroom with the men. So let's give them their own classroom across the river. And it wasn't really a classroom. It was a little meeting room. And um, by the way, that grading curve that we use across the river with the men, that's probably not going to work either. So um, instead of the bottom 10%, being of, which is the grading curve over across the river, bottom 10% is expelled at the end, for end of the first year. Let's go ahead and raise that bar and say that if they don't make it into the top 10% of grades, they're expelled. That's a different curve, in case you can't follow that. Uh, the, the women in this section, the section, the, the all-female section, agreed that what they would do to help each other was to divide the subject matter. And each person would take a different subject. And those subjects would, um, they would prepare very deeply on those subjects and share their notes to help the rest of the team. Barbara's draw was macroeconomics. It's a very hard subject. If you remember taking it or hearing about taking it, it's got, a, it's got calculus in it. And she hadn't been exposed to that uh, level of math in her high school. Barbara read the textbook, which was how they taught it. They kind of dropped off the textbook and said, good luck. Barbara read the textbook, preparing her notes, and she got really angry. And she's telling me the story. She's like, I'm really pissed about this. I was like, I would be pissed too. This is like injustice in a big way. She goes, no, honey, that's not, she calls me honey. That's uh, not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about he's such a bad writer. He was wasting my time. It took me three times as long as it should have to figure this out. That's where she came up with the pyramid principle. This is something that if you learn how to do it, Barbara believes, and I believe too, it will 
transform your career is to write and communicate in an executive style. And people around the world have paid her gazillions of dollars to teach this method. You can buy her book called The Pyramid Principle on Amazon. It's 200 and some odd dollars. That's how valuable she knows this is. This is the five cent tour uh, of the idea. Barbara says, the best executive communication starts out with stating the situation. This is the state of affairs. Here's the facts. It's unambiguous and it's totally not controversial. Here's the complication. Here's what's changed that's making things harder. Here's the question that naturally rises up out of situation and complication. And by the way, if you're an executive, you have to answer that question. Let me show you an example. Or this, this is a cartoon of what we just described. That answer that you give, this is why it's called the pyramid principle, answer first with the logic of your argument beneath it in a supportive structure. Let's see an example. This is a real live paragraph out of a real live email at an e-commerce company. We're doing okay in watches, not as great as we could be. We've got decent growth rates and new promotions look good. I don't like what I'm seeing on repeat purchase rates. Those are down about 10%. I think we should make it a priority to do more research, yada, yada, yada. You can read it. This is real. This is how people talk when they're talking about how are things going. If Barbara were here, she would say, please don't waste my time. The answer that this person got back as an up-and-coming leader inside the company was, okay, thanks. The question that originated it was, how's business going? And what silently happened that this person never knew was that she had been moved from the, I don't know, maybe this is a real executive high potential person. Let's see what she or he can do. In this case, it was a she. She had been moved by the recipient of this email into the, yikes, I'm not sure that she's executive material bucket and she would never get that feedback directly. But that's what happens every day when either we or our teammates are allowed to communicate this way to people. It wastes their time, it makes them think there's something missing up here, and that's not the case. Here it is Mintoized. It's a little hard to read, so I'll just fly through the, deep, the, the summary. As we discussed, watches are critical, they're 15% of our growth, and a feeder category for jewelry and shoes. We're plus 3% to the sales plan year to date. Situation. There's nothing ambiguous or controversial around that. Complication. Repeat purchase rates are down 10% and that costs us about 300 basis points of growth. What should we do? Pose the question directly. Here's my trial answer. We're going to do these three things. The difference between this and this is opportunities if you, can, if you or your team can practice these techniques, opportunities become open to you that would otherwise be closed. And you may or may not decide those promotions or those senior roles or more influence is what you want for your career, but I want that to be your decision, not the boss who is too timid to say, your writing kind of stinks. This is, the, this is a transformative thing in people's career. And, and I teach this repeatedly to the startups I work with and to the up-and-comers that are coming through these companies, both companies I've invested in and companies I haven't, because nobody will tell you that you suck at this. They just will stop giving you cool new gigs. This is something we've got to address and fix ourselves. Why should you practice this? Because communicating badly stunts your growth. And doing it expertly opens up opportunities. Communication is the grease in the gears, and we should not be shy about saying that we need more grease uh, in our gears. We're moving these machines very quickly. And then lastly, practice makes you better quickly and massively. And if Barbara were here, she would say, she has transformed the careers of people by teaching this method. If you're interested in either of these ideas, either the idea of Harriet Tubman's model for scaling or Barbara Minto's pyramid principle, um, I'll suggest uh, two videos which are on my website, harrisonmetal.com. They're three four-minute videos that recap some of the things that we've talked about just now, and I'd be happy to point you to more resources if they're helpful. If you struggle with any of these things, these tips and tricks can help. If, More importantly, if the people that are depending on you to be a great colleague and boss are struggling with these things, you can help them by pointing them in the right direction. Thank you so much.